Father, thank you for this time in your word. And Father, we praise you that uh, men and women would set aside time on a busy evening in the middle of the week to study your word and to gather with one another. Father, we know that uh, too often as we think about our plans for each week and as we make priorities, so often, Father, we do not put you in your rightful place at the top of our schedule. And Father, we, we confess that and we ask that the time we spend tonight, Father, might be a time that you would use richly to offer us an opportunity, Father, to see what we've been missing, to understand the importance that you place on your word and to appreciate, Father, that uh, your word is your appointed vessel for bringing men and women to faith and for equipping your saints, Father, for the work of the ministry you've handed to them. And Father, we are grateful that we have found time in our week to do this study and to be here and to hear from your Spirit. May our teaching tonight, Father, be according to your Spirit. May your Holy Spirit be active in our hearts and minds. And Father, we pray that uh, what you have in store for us here tonight would reflect mightily in the way we live our life. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, let's open it up to chapter 15 of Luke. Last week we ended... Uh, at about verse 12, after we had gone through the first two of the three parables in this important chapter in the Gospel of Luke. And uh, we'd also begun in the first few verses of the prodigal son. And as we ended last week, we saw that the Pharisees, uh, as they watched Jesus sitting with the sinners and with the tax collectors at the beginning of chapter 15, we saw the Pharisees unable to understand why God would dare show such favor to sinners, and and more specifically why Jesus was so adamant about giving time to those people. And we saw Jesus teaching the sinners and teaching the tax collectors, and as he began these parables, he began to communicate to the Pharisees themselves that sinners are a thing of value to God, that they are worthy of being counted, of being found, and of being restored. And we also saw as we began the prodigal son that we were looking at a story a story where we were following not just one son, but two sons, as we said last week. And the story began with the first, the younger of the two, the rebellious son, a son who we saw longed to distance himself from his father's authority. And in that uh, relationship, we also saw a patient father, a man willing to grant his son the distance that his son desired just for the chance to preserve that relationship. And we'll look at that more again tonight. So, As we go into chapter 15 again, let's begin where we left off in verse 13. Luke 15, verse 13. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his field to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him anything to eat. When I began to teach about the audacity of this young man's request last week, you you might remember that I mentioned that his request required that the father do some extraordinary things to liquidate the estate. Remember that he had come to his father and said, give me my share of the estate, and If you look carefully in verse 12 from last week, you'll notice that it says that the father divided the estate between them. And what this means is that he had to find a way to liquidate his estate. He had to find some way to turn all the property that that constituted his estate and uh, turn it into some kind of liquidity, some kind of uh, monetary value so that he could divide it between these two men. Now, it is also possible that he could have simply allocated some of his possessions to each man. And and you remember that we said that under the law, the older son was worthy of double the portion of the younger son. So that would mean in this case that the older son had two-thirds of the estate while this younger son was going to receive his one-third. So it is possible that the father did nothing more than simply indicate to each son which part of the estate was his. Um, But regardless, the son's request meant that he not only wanted the value of this property, but he was also communicating, as we said last week, that he had no interest in his father's business. In fact, some commentators have suggested that this father would have even 
gone to the trouble of conducting a funeral upon his son's departure just, just to make the point that his son was as dead to him. If you keep in mind that most people would not inherit an estate unless the father had died, there was also symbolism perhaps in that. But in any case, looking at verse 13 today, we see the son gathering his property together, which means essentially in the Greek that he turned what he had into cash. So here again, we might see the moment at this point in verse 13 where the son has actually taken the property that he was given by the father and he has found someone willing to buy it, perhaps at a discount, but in any event, he's turned it into cash. And then we hear that he has gone a long distance and he has squandered his estate. He has spent everything that he has. I think it's interesting as you look at this son's behavior that we, we know from the, from the text here that he has traveled as far from the father's influence as he can get. He leaves fully intending to depend on himself, to provide for himself, and to rely only on himself. I want you to go back to something I mentioned at the end of last week. I remember from last week mentioning that Adam's fall in the garden is pictured perfectly here in the way this young son is rejecting the authority of the father. Now, I want you to consider how that picture is building even more as we go into these verses now. Remember I said last week that the effect of Adam's sin was that he was showing a desire to be independent of the father, to essentially go his own way and not obey the father. That's very much what we see here with this younger son. But now we understand from the text that the son not only wanted the wealth of the father and the independence, but he goes out of his way to travel a long distance. I want you to consider Adam's sin in the garden. We know from scripture that that sin places a barrier between men and between God. And that sin places an infinite separation between mankind and his creator, a barrier that can no longer be crossed apart from grace. We can no longer be in God's presence Uh, If you remember in the story of the garden, how when God returned to the garden and he found man and he found woman hiding, he does not bring them out from the hiding. He leaves them behind the the places they're hiding because if he had brought them into his presence, their very sin in his presence would have demanded judgment and would have demanded their uh, ultimate destruction. So in his grace, he allows them to be separated from him. And now we have here in this picture of the son that same representation that his desire to disobey the Father has put a huge distance between the two. He is moving out from the influence of the Father as far as he can possibly get. Now the picture building here is the quintessential picture of man's fall into sin by way of disobedience to the Father and with the consequences of separation from the Father and a reliance on self rather than on the Father. We have seen all the pattern here building of how men were separated from God on the part of, by, the, by the nature of their sin. And when this young man's resources have run out, as we see here in the parable, the unexpected occurs. The famine occurs. What was once an abundance of food, now that's disappeared. And God produces a stress on the earth here. You might consider this a trial, a test of this young man. And in the testing and in the trial, the man is brought face to face with the consequences of his sin. Isn't it remarkable how Jesus constructed this story because it's really, if you look at it carefully, it's really a story of extremes in almost every way. For example, in the beginning, we had examples of extreme shame and extreme audacity on the part of the younger son. And uh, you should know that in the Eastern culture of Jesus' day, that there, there were probably few scenarios you could imagine more shameful for this family than the one that Jesus described here in this parable. It was an extreme example of a bad, disobedient, disrespectful son. And it was also an extreme example of a patient, forgiving father. Remember last week, as I introduced tonight, I reminded you of how this father had really three choices in the face of this disobedience. On the one hand, he could have denied the son's request to have the inheritance, essentially forcing him to stay there in the family. And we we said last week that if the father had done that, he he might have had the presence of his son. His son would have been around But he would not have had the relationship with his son. His son would not have had a desire, a true heartfelt desire to be in a loving relationship with his father. He would have been angry at his father. He would have uh, obviously been upset and and, uh, felt cheated by his father. There would have been no love, no true relationship. So if he had uh, made the boy stay, he would not have gained the relationship he wanted. On the other hand, he could have disciplined the son. He could have kicked him out of his home. He could have uh, taken away any opportunity for an inheritance and made him pay for his uh, disrespect, but of course, then he wouldn't have a relationship either. So the third choice he had was to grant the son his request. 
And that really was the only one that had any hope of restoring his son one day, that in, in the hope that one day his son would see the error of his ways, the father expects that maybe his son will return. And this is an extreme example of a patient, forgiving father. Few fathers in that day, or in this day, probably would have been expected to do that. And now we have this extreme example of the way the son has wasted his, his money. This extreme example of how he was caught up, not just in foolish spending, but in the debauchery of how he chose to spend his money. The man here, remember, takes a significant fortune. And we know this based on the kind of family we see represented in this parable, a family with plenty of land and with servants and hired men, a father who can afford to throw the lavish party that we see occurring here at the end of the parable. So we know this family has significant wealth. And this man has taken a third of that significant wealth and squandered it with loose living, we're told. The word for squandered is diascorpizo. And in the Greek, this literally means uh, throwing into the wind, scattering to the wind. It actually is used in, in a description of farming when you take the, the produce from the field, the wheat, and you have it, uh, the, the grain mixed in with the chaff, and you throw it up in the breeze of the wind and allow the wind to carry the chaff away. That's diascorpizo. So the Luke here, as he describes the way uh, this man spent his money, uses a word in the Greek which says the man's throwing his money away, literally throwing it to the wind, scattering it to the wind. And not only is he just squandering it in, in, in any particular way, he's squandering it in loose living, which we know would mean he's uh, using his money for immoral purposes. We actually see later in the story, as the older son says, that he used his money to buy prostitutes. So it's an extreme example of how he wasted his wealth. And, and I also want you to remember that in our day, we, we are comfortable to some extent seeing rich playboys, rich spoiled uh, uh, men and women uh, who have made their money one way or another, wasting it, throwing it away, often in the public view. And that, that's really a consequence of the age we live in. It's a consequence of a, of a time when people have a lot of money and it can be easy come, easy go. That wasn't the case in Jesus' day. In that day, it was a rare thing, for one, man, for, for one thing, to see somebody with significant wealth. It took a lot of hard work. It took a long time and a lot of patience. And uh, you, you know, getting rich quickly was not common in that day. So if somebody had significant wealth, it usually represented generations of, and generations of hard work. So for one thing, finding wealth was unusual. But on top of that, somebody who would go to so little effort to waste so much was almost unheard of. And so... Jesus now has piled extreme upon extreme in this remarkable story to just emphasize all the more the point of what this young man did. And now you see Jesus taking this story to a new low when he mentions how this man has actually been reduced in his shame and in his poverty. Verse 15 says he's hired himself to a citizen of that country. The word for hired there in the Greek literally means cleaved to the person. It's, he's become essentially a desperate beggar looking for anyone to save him. And the, and the image you have here is one of a man who's so desperate he is actually clinging to another man as he, almost as he walks by. And if you've, if you've ever traveled to third world countries or a very impoverished place in the world, then you, you have some sense, I'm sure, of what this looks like when you have people who are at uh, their wit's end, they're, they're starving, they have very little hope for food or for money in any way. And someone of some means comes by, and uh, again, if you've ever traveled to that part of the world, you know what it's like when a Westerner walks in or to a village where there's, there's very little of anything. The, they draw an instant crowd. People are, are clinging to them, coming right up to them, looking for some opportunity to, to be rescued by the wealth of this person. And that's what we hear happening here with this young man as he is hiring, hiring himself to a citizen of that country. And... You know, just like anyone who, who would be in that situation, this man, whoever it was, decided that the only way he could get this boy off him was to give him a chance to work. And he, he gave him essentially the lowest job you could give somebody, which was feeding the pigs in his farm or in his trough. Now here again, the story, as I've said already, begins to draw a distinct parallel between uh, the, the events of this boy and his life and the world of sin and of man's predicament in this world. For example, Scripture tells us that we are enslaved by our sin. We, we are all in bondage to our sin before we come to faith in Christ. And in fact, if you want to look at Scripture elsewhere, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15 says that before faith, all men are in slavery to the devil through our fear of death and the punishment that follows. 
And as the desperation of this man's sinful condition begins to weigh on his conscience, and, and as he is driven further and further into the fear of death, his behavior now reflects that fear, letting himself be lower to the point of feeding pigs in order to make a living. And, and don't you see the same thing in our world today? If you look around the world today, don't you see people who as they come to the later stages of, of their life, and, and a life here specifically without Christ, and in the fears that are driven by that, by that state in their life where they know that the end is drawing near, do, do you see the kinds of behaviors that are driven by that fear? The kinds of concerns over money and over health and over their financial security in retirement or over uh, being a victim of crime in their home, too afraid to even go out uh, anymore because they're afraid of what might happen to them. These are the kinds of fears driven by a, ultimately a fear of death that are uh, really characterizing the, the nature and the life of an unbeliever who has no hope. And, and I know it doesn't necessarily have to be a conscious kind of thought. It's often unconscious. It's subconscious in many cases that, that they have this innate fear and they can't, can't even articulate it for, uh, necessarily. But it is still the case, and Scripture backs this up, that all men are enslaved by their sin and the devil takes advantage of that, uh, of that condition to his own advantage and in the playing on men's fears, compels them to do his bidding. And just when the audience thought that this son's situation couldn't get any worse, driven by hunger, driven by desperation, uh, to be uh, hired to this man from another country, and to be desperate in his, in his need for work, the story takes it to the bottom for a Jewish son, for any Jewish son to have gone off in this way and have squandered his wealth and to have gone into essentially slavery to a Gentile. All of that was terrible enough. But here we see in these verses, the story now says the sons feeding pigs and wishing to eat what they eat. You, you just you can't imagine how low that was. <laughs> that, that, that absolutely hits rock bottom for this audience. And not only is it because it's a despicable kind of way to make a living, but of course the pig is an unclean animal under the Jewish law. So to be associated with this animal in the way that this young man has been associated with it means that, that he is now defiled. Under the Jewish law, he is now a defiled sinner. And he cannot even come into fellowship with other Jews or with anyone in the nation of Israel until he goes through ceremonial cleaning, as the law would require. And this is now the bottom of his life. For all that he's been trying to do, he is now at the very bottom. And I find it interesting as you look at his situation right now, and if it were possible for you to, to go near this man and ask him about the state of affairs of his life at this point, I wonder what he would say. I wonder if you'd be able to ask him, has he found any satisfaction in all the things he has done or in the course that his life has taken? I mean, think what he's doing right now. He's cleaving to someone that he believes can give him what he needs to rescue him from his desperation. And in the course of that relationship, he's doing all the hard work he can possibly do. He's bound himself to this man. He's working hard. He's doing all that he can do in his power to correct for his mistakes, to make up for his errors, to earn himself back a little ways from this point of desperation that he's now found himself in. And, and yet, for all his hard work, it, it doesn't seem to work. He can't seem to get ahead. No, nothing's good enough. He can't get ahead. He's still hungry. In fact, the text tells us that no one was giving him anything to eat. That despite all his effort, he's found absolutely no satisfaction. Every step he takes has moved him one step further away from his goal. He cannot find the kind of peace and fulfillment and satisfaction that he's looking for, either through the loose living, now through his attempts to work himself back into good graces and to some kind of stable setting again, some kind of stable situation. He's absolutely desperate, uh, without any alternatives and seemingly without hope. It says he longs to eat what the pigs eat, which is a sure sign of starvation. In fact, if you want to make a comparison for your own life, uh, try this someday. Uh, go home, and if you uh, have a pet, uh, let's say, for example, a cat, I want you to go into your, your uh, pantry and I want you to open up cat food a can of cat food, and I want you to look at that, and I want you to consider taking a spoon and eating it. And if the, if the idea is repulsive to you, I want you to consider how hungry would you have to be to consider eating that food and enjoying it. And I want you to remember that what the pigs were eating was even more disgusting than what you would find in that, cat, in that uh, can of cat food. And this man is wishing to eat what the pigs eat. That's how hungry he is. And in the moment of his desperation, at this low point in his life, something remarkable happened. 
In Luke 15, verse 17, we hear, But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. In verse 17, he came to his senses, we're told. The, the word there is hetau. It means conscious, as in he became conscious. He, be, he, he became alive. This is a remarkable transformation. You know, In the parable, the son, we're told, realizes that his father is loving and, grace, and gracious and has riches at his disposal, and he's generous with those riches. And the way we know this is because he remembers that even the hired men have more than enough bread. In that day, there, were, there was essentially a caste system of uh, workers, of people who were employed for a living. And you, you could start at the top of that scale with the, the landowners or, the, biz, or, or the, uh, the wealthy business owners of that day who had plenty of their own and were able to hire many men to work for them. And then below that, you might have the artisans of the day or the small businessmen who might be able to hire a few men to work with them. But below them, you had the skilled men who were employed full-time, working for one, either for the artisans or for the landowners. But as you move further down that scale, you eventually reach the hired men, the hired help. These were men who were day laborers. They would not have a permanent job, and every day they would go out looking for one day's work, and they would expect to be paid at the end of that day. So they were always living one day to the next, each day receiving a day's pay, and if they didn't have work on a given day, they may not have any food or, or any money that day to buy even food. So they were always right on the edge of poverty, right on the edge of being destitute. But as long as they could find work, they would be okay. And the son remembers back that his father's hired men had more than enough to eat, which tells you all you need to know about the father's kindness and generosity because it means he was paying these hired men more than the normal day's wage for their work. He was exceedingly generous and these men were living well, though they were day laborers. And it's this realization that leads the young man in our story to have a changed conscience. This is such a perfect picture of how God works to bring sinners back to himself. In Romans 2, verse 4, we learn that the kindness of God leads us to repentance. And it was that way here. The, the father's kindness is on the mind of this young man as he comes to his senses and he plans, as he considers his father's kindness, he plans for how he's going to ask for his father's forgiveness. And I want you to consider that this is exactly the pattern that all men and all women follow as the father influences their heart to understand his kindness and to shower his grace on them so that they recognize his mercy and they come back to him for forgiveness. Paul makes the same point in his letter to Titus when he says in Titus 3, verse 3, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Doesn't that sound just like what's going on here with this young man? And what's really remarkable, the really remarkable part of this whole scene is what we hear in those opening words of the verses I just read out of Luke, this intriguing opening statement where we're told the man came to his senses. He became conscious. He was awakened to the truth of the Father's love. But, but the question for us is what awakened him? What led him to this awareness? Are, are we simply saying that any time somebody reaches the lowest point in their life, a moment of, of utter desperation, that that will automatically trigger in them this awakening? Is it that simple? Are we saying that there's a one-to-one -one relationship? Anytime somebody gets desperate enough, they'll become a Christian? They'll become a believer in the one true God? Well, our own experience tells us that's not the case. We, we can all find examples either in our own lives or in what we've read elsewhere that tell us that there are plenty of people every day, in fact, who face the desperation of this world and regrettably never come to a true, honest faith in the living God or into Christ himself before they die. So that being, brings us back to the question in this story. What is it that brought this boy to an awareness of the Father's love, of his graciousness, of his kindness? What brought about his repentance? Well, Scripture is very clear 
on what stimulates the heart of a sinner to turn toward God. The scripture tells us that this awareness comes because of an act of God himself, because of the Holy Spirit. It is an act of God that a man would even desire to turn away from his sin and turn toward God. One of the clearest verses out of scripture that illustrates this is John chapter 6 verse 44. No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless the Father who sent me draws him. The prodigal son parable perfectly reflects, I believe, the most basic of principles in this story of how man is restored to God in the, in the theology of salvation. That men are desperately wicked, without hope. They do not seek after God. They're like this son who has decided that independence from the father is their only desire. And just like the son distanced himself from God, we are all born into a state of sin that, we, that means we are also at a distance from God and unable to approach. And we remain in that state, going ever further into sin and always seeking after things and working hard, trying to make what we want happen in this life, trying to find the spiritual satisfaction that is, that is yearning inside of all, all of us. And yet, despite that hard work, we get nowhere. We only get further from the Father. We only get more desperate. Our, our sinful nature only drives us deeper and deeper into despair until, at some point, perhaps, the Father, through His Holy Spirit, would draw us toward Him. And on the basis of His kindness, because of the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart, to quicken men to the truth of the, of the gospel and to a knowledge of God Himself and of His love for us, then men turn to God and are repentant of their sin. And this Son, having been brought to repentance by God Himself, recognizes His sin and recognizes the need to go back to the Father and ask for forgiveness. And, and I really love the fact that this story includes this moment where the son contemplates that interaction with the father. He, he plans for how he's going to approach the father. And what's so fascinating about this for me is how often we all do exactly the same thing. I, I don't know how your uh, salvation experience occurred if you are a believer, but I know in my case there is that glimmer of a, of a moment where you wonder, what do I say? You've had that changed heart. There's something in you that's different. You're open to the gospel. You've, you've understood its truth and now you recognize that you must receive it, but you're not quite sure what the pattern is. What's, what's the approved way you return to the Father? And so many of us must have had some picture in our mind of what was required. We had to say certain words. We had to recite a certain prayer. We had to walk down the aisle and shake someone's hand and pray with someone and kneel in front of something. Or we had to go through some class and confirm ourselves as being a Christian. Or we had to, uh, you know, to submit to a certain ritual. And until that was done, there was a question about whether or not the Father would receive us. There's a, an impression we often leave people, if we're not careful, that implies that this ritual is elementary to becoming a Christian. But if you just look at this story for a moment, and if, and if we understand what Scripture has to say on the point, it, it becomes obvious that at the moment you're starting to consider doing those things, it's proof in itself that your heart's already changed. No one stands up and says, I want to go seek after God and repent of my sin and believe in Christ unless that changed heart has already occurred. And the fact that the heart has been changed is proof in itself that God has already done the work, that that person is already a believer. What's remaining is for them to be obedient to the call of a believer. And the call of a believer is to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, and to be baptized. Those are acts of obedience that follow a changed heart, which itself happens because of God. And just like in the case of a, of a sinner who's confused about how to approach the Father, you see here the Son saying, I need to go back, but I have to have a plan for how I approach the Father. Well, let's see how his plan actually works out. In chapter 15, verse 20, we hear, So he got up and came to his Father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come back to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. So the son takes this plan that he's devised and he begins to walk back to the father. 
But long before the son could ever reach the father's house, we're told, the father sees the son and and runs to meet him. Now, much has been said and and taught about this remarkable scene, and and justifiably so. It's, It's probably the climax of this story. It's unfortunate, though, that because it's such a significant moment and because it's such a memorable scene, uh, some teachers are prone to stopping here. I've actually heard this parable taught up to about verse 24 and then nothing more. The story's over apparently and we go, uh, you know, we say the last prayer, have the last song and leave and go to lunch. <laughs> and I know that that's probably just a facet of time and time limitations sometimes, but, but the truth is we're, we're about halfway through the parable. There's so much more to come. We've only studied one of the two sons. Now, looking at this scene for a moment, there's, there's been much written as well about the extremes represented in this very moment. And as you know, I've been saying all along, this is a story of extremes. And here again, we have more extremes piled on top of the previous ones. For example, we have here a son returning to his father, a son that, that has been considered dead, that has been gone for some extended period of time, probably. He's coming back in a terrible condition. He's destitute. He's been working with pigs, so he's defiled. And he has the gall to even think about coming back to a father who should, if he did what was expected, put his son to death or uh, refuse to even talk to him or allow him back in the family. But somehow, this son thinks that his father might actually be willing to receive him back. This is an extreme in itself. Uh, The son has no reason to expect that his father would ever bring him back into the household. And if you were one of the people in the crowd listening to this story, you'd be thinking the same thing. What kind of son would assume that his father would even dare to look at him, much less bring him back into the home? And the father, by the way, would have been within his rights to to go as far as to put the son to death for what he had done. And so here you have a son coming back thinking, if I can just work my way back, into my father's good graces, perhaps I can survive in his home. And that's his plan. Remember, his plan was to come back and be a hired helper. You remember the story in Genesis of Jacob and Laban, how Jacob, after he had uh, cheated his brother Esau out of the birthright, had escaped his brother's anger by fleeing to uh, live with his uncle Laban. And when he reaches Laban, he he notices Laban has a good-looking daughter, Rachel, and he wants to marry Rachel. And Laban says, if you'll work work for me for seven years, then you can earn my my daughter's hand. Of course, that didn't work out very well because he ended up with Leah instead of Rachel. And so he had to work another seven years on top of that to get the second wife he really wanted. So he worked 14 years to earn two wives. Now, considering that, I want you to imagine how hard would this young boy in the story Uh, have had to work for his father? How long would he have had to work for his father to pay back almost a lifetime worth of wealth? There's little reason to think that his plan was going to succeed. It was really a very uh, silly plan, if you think about it. There was so much debt to pay. He owed so much, well beyond his ability to pay off in his lifetime. And yet he goes back with this ridiculous assumption that the father is going to welcome him into the home and allow him to pay back that debt, a debt that was unpayable. And what's even more remarkable, as we look at how this story has continued, what's even more extreme is the father's reaction. The father, we're told, is watching for his son. And we know this because while the son is still a long way off, the father notices him and runs to greet him. And it it can't be explained except that this father has been watching and waiting for his son's return now almost daily since his son left. That's an extreme thing for the father to do. First of all, the father has been wronged by this son. He should not expect him back. He should not ask for him to return or want him to return. And then secondly, it's an embarrassing thing. It's It's a silly thing. It's a shameful thing for the father to be watching for his son daily. Others would go by and see the father at at perhaps a a point on top of the home where he can see a better distance and know that he's watching for this wayward son and they would be thinking to themselves, what a foolish man. This man has been shamed by his own son and yet he continues to watch for him which only makes him look even more shameful. It's a father that is hope beyond hope for something that the rest of the world would have given up on. And remember what we said earlier, the strategy that this father must have been thinking when he let his son go, the strategy that said, The only way I might hope to have my son back is if I was willing to let him go. This this is, I think, the motivation for the father's waiting, that his plan has always included a hope of a return. And in that, he had reason to wait. 
It's an extreme display of faith and patience on the part of the Father. And then the, the piece of the story that, that so many of us know so well, I'm sure, this, this extreme moment where you see the Father run. This is an unbelievable aspect of the story for somebody in that day and in that culture. Running in the Jewish world, running in, running in that day and age, in that culture, was a shameful act for any grown man. Uh, running all by itself was seen as shameful, and I don't mean just because he's running to greet this son who was so disrespectful, but just the very act of running is shameful. John MacArthur, when he teaches this parable, uh, mentions that there is an entire body of Jewish literature that speaks to the issue of not running, a, a literature that makes clear that Jewish men of honor never run. And the reason they never run is because a man could never show his legs in public. The Hebrew word, in fact, for, for robe, the, the, the piece of clothing that they wore that hung all the way to the ground and hid their legs, the word for robe in Hebrew literally means that which gives me honor. Because it was honorable that you would never show your legs in public and, and conversely, to, see, to let someone see your legs would have been very dishonorable. In fact, there's this famous story in some of that literature of a rabbi who condemned a man for lifting his tunic just to avoid getting it caught on thorns as he walked through bushes. So you can see how seriously they took this, this concern about not showing your legs to anyone. And remember, if you're going to wear a long tunic that reaches all the way to the ground, the only way you can run effectively is to do something that the Bible calls girding your loins, which means you take this tunic and you pull it up and you wrap it around your waist so that it's uh, up off the ground and away from your legs, and then you can run freely. But of course, the moment you were to do that, your legs would be visible. And of course, in that, you would be shaming yourself. So no one ever ran. If I wanted to help you understand this and put it into contemporary terms, I, I would have to ask you to imagine a father today who is so excited, by, perhaps by the, the return of his own son, that he jumps out of the shower and doesn't even take time to dress so that he runs down the street maybe with, with just a towel wrapped around him, or perhaps even worse, maybe he just runs down the street naked today. That, that might be one way for you to appreciate what Jesus is suggesting that this father did in his day by, by running through the street. Of course, um, in order for that contemporary picture to work, you're going to have to agree with me that running down the street naked is a bad thing. <laughs> Unfortunately, in this day and age, it's not so much the case. But, but certainly that would have been a shameful act uh, in most people's minds today, and that is the case for someone who ran in Jesus' day. It, it's really hard to exaggerate how shameful this act was for the father. But nevertheless, this father runs, or in fact the word in Greek is sprints, as in like an Olympic sprint. He's running at full clip straight through the public uh, town s square or, or next to the, uh, the road that goes through the village or in some way but between himself and his son. He's taking the, the road that his son is probably walking on and he's running down the street to meet his son. And the father in doing this is subjecting himself to public humiliation and to public shame yet again uh, on behalf of his son. But that should beg a question from you and it begs a question for me as well. Why run? I mean, why does this father need to get to his son so quickly? I mean, after all, his son is coming back. If he just waits in the home, the son will be there sure enough. He's, he's probably only a, a, a few minutes walk away. I mean, how far could he really see anyway? So he's probably within a few minutes of the home. Why is there a need for the father to run? Is he just impatient? Is he just uh, is in such a so happy about his son's return that he had to run? Is that really all there is to it? But that makes no sense when you consider how extreme running was how shameful it was. You, you, there must be a better answer for why the father felt the need here to subject himself to such humiliation just to get to his son a few minutes sooner. Well, that's another element of the extreme represented here. The extreme that this father goes to to shield his son from public humiliation and scorn because you have to understand this son would have been well known in that town. What he had done to the father, what, he had, what, what had happened when he had been with the father and then and, and, and how he had treated his father before he left, all of that would have been well known. And what's more, I would assume that what he had done while he was away might have come back to the village, that someone there might have heard the stories of how he was squandering his wealth. And we can assume that because the son, out, the older son who eventually comes in from the field and finds out that the younger son has returned, if you look carefully down the page of your Bible and look at some of the verses that we haven't read yet, you'll notice that the older son makes the comment that he squandered his wealth on prostitutes. 
That would tell me that the, there has been rumor, there has been some kind of word coming back to the home, coming back to the village about what this younger son has been doing while he's away. So now, not only is he known in that village as someone who disrespected his family and left, but he now has a reputation as an immoral man, a man who has gone into greater depths of shame in the time he's been gone. And now, if you were to look at this young man walking back into the town as he approaches his father's home, he would have looked like somebody who was destitute. He would have still had the clothes on that he had when he was trying to feed the pigs. I mean, if he had had better clothes, he would have sold them already for money. So he has to look absolutely despicable, dirty, smelly, uh, someone who has clearly reached a low point in his life. His reputation now is even more ruined. So everyone who would have seen him as he walked into that town would have known who he was and would have, would have stood and stared at him and and recognized his disgrace. And you could even assume that as he walked back to his father's estate by himself, had the father stayed in the estate and waited for him, he, this son would have had to parade himself through the countryside, through the surrounding homes, and in through the village. And he would have been noticed, and he would have been mocked. And he would have been insulted. And he would have been told, why bother coming back here? Don't be, you, you have no business here. Uh, you, you, you should never return here. You, have, you, ha, you are as good as dead to us. And in perhaps he would have faced even worse. Perhaps someone would have wanted to take the law into their own hands and bring him under the judgment of the law and thrown a stone at him and encouraged others to do the same. We don't know for, for sure what would have happened, but you can assume this boy would have been met with a very hostile reception in that town. And you can bet the father would have known this too. And knowing that this son might receive the mocking and the scorn and the anger of that, of that town, he decides to take that shame for the son. He decides to take the shame on himself because whatever shame the son may have to suffer, whatever attention he was going to receive from that town as he walked through that town, the father, by his willingness to run through the center of the town in the way that he did, his act more than eclipsed the shame of that son. His act would have been legend. His act would have immediately uh, taken over all the talk in that town. And in doing so, he was protecting his son from the accusations and the taunts of the crowd. He took the shame for his son so that as he met his son and as he puts the robe and the other articles on his son and brings him back to the house, he is protecting his son from that ire, from, from that mocking. He himself has shielded the son. Now, can we draw any parallels here? to our own experience in coming to the Lord. We've been looking at this all along as we've studied through this parable, making, a, a, making the connection between what Jesus is teaching in this parable, what men and women are experiencing in general, having fallen in the garden under Adam and now inherited sin and now brought to faith one man at a time. Well, what is the parallel here? Well, I want you to consider in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where we're told to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. God took the shame and punishment of our sin so that we would not have to. Just as this father was willing to assume the shame for his son and protect his son, likewise you and I saw the shame that was rightly due us for the crimes and the sins we've committed uh, borne by Christ when he hung on that cross so that we would not have to bear that shame as well. And what's also interesting to me as I study in this and as I look at this scene, I wonder about the fact that even now we're told in Scripture that our enemy, Satan, stands ready to heap shame upon us. If only he could make it stick. Revelation 12.10 says that Satan comes before God's throne even now and he is the great accuser of the saints. But we also know his accusations fall on deaf ears for we have been made clean before God by Christ's blood. And so as the son returns and his father welcomes him, his father is shielding him from the, the very kinds of accusations that this crowd might heap upon him, just as now the father is shielding us from Satan's accusations, knowing that his son has already paid the penalty. And so as the son returns and the father welcomes him, I want you to notice as the son came to his father and prepared to deliver that, that statement that he had probably practiced time and time again as he came down the, the path and got nearer and nearer to the village, did you notice how the confession came out but it stops short. The father does not allow the son to go further than to make his confession. There's, there's no offer there to work for the father. They never get to the point of discussing how he has so much to earn back and there is so much work to be done and he's going to be a hired man and, and all of that. 
All that thinking that the son must have devoted to what he had to do to earn his father's favor, none of that comes into the discussion at all. It's almost as if the father stops the son from even going into that part of the discussion, that he interrupts him just because he will hear nothing of it. And isn't that how it is with our Father in Heaven? You know, so often Christians are, are left to think at times that though they are saved by grace, there is something more to be done. That somehow our, our, our faith is enough, but it's not enough. That somehow we have something we need to do to please the Father. And yes, there are plenty of things the Father asks us to do in conforming our life to Christ. That much is true, but, but there's a difference between what we do to please God and what we do to earn His favor. We don't earn the favor that God merits out by grace. That is a favor that He gives us freely. Scripture tells us that you cannot earn anything except that by faith you would please the Father. And in having faith, in faith we are now capable of doing the things God asks us to do. And in doing those things of obedience, He would say to us on the day that we stand before Him, well done, my good and faithful servant. We've become a servant to Him having believed in Him by faith. But it's not the case that so often Christians make the distinction. And so we're, and if we're not careful in how we teach it, if we're not careful in how we witness to other people or in how we live our own lives, we stand the risk of confusing the two issues for the sake of a, of a young Christian, one who may not understand some of the depths of Scripture yet. And what you see here in the prodigal son is a perfect picture of how father, the Father receives us back. There is no more work to be done. The debt that this son had to his father was so great, he could never have paid it off. And the father gives no attention to that debt. Once the son has come back in repentance, there is no debt as far as the father is concerned. The father welcomes him back into the family as a full son. And if you look at the articles that the father gives to the son, these articles of sonship, they represent the fact that this son has been restored fully into the family. For example, he gets a robe. The robe was a royal garment in that day. We're talking here about the kind of robe you'd put on a king or a prince. It, it indicated how he was now part of that family again, and he had a place of honor in that family. Secondly, we're told he gets the ring from the father. This, this is the way the father would communicate that the son had the right to rule in the father's estate, on the father's business, on behalf of the father. The ring was often a ring with an insignia on it, and in that day and for, for centuries before and after, men would often uh, indicate their acceptance of, to, to a contract or their, they'd put their signature on an order by pushing the, the ring into soft wax on the paper. And that impression in the wax was their signature. So he's giving the son a ring that indicates the son now can rule in his place on the behalf of the father. And then sandals. Uh, sandals may not sound like anything significant, but in that day, that article of clothing was reserved for the privileged. Working men didn't have sandals. Common men didn't have sandals. It was for those of privilege in the household. What the son has received here from the father is a full claim to sonship again. No, bar, no, no strings attached. No bar to what he can be uh, allowed to do as the son now. There's nothing more to be done. And he didn't earn it. He did nothing more then come with a changed conscience. And he came in a decision to repent, with a repenting heart. And he returned to a father that he knew would show him kindness. And the father accepted him joyfully. Now aren't the parallels to our own restoration with God getting even easier here? You see men confess their sins. God is faithful and just to forgive their sins and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. That's what Scripture teaches. And when God does that, his restoration is a full restoration to the position of sonship, a position that Adam lost in the garden, a position that was lost when we were born, but now a position we can regain by faith because of Christ's work on the cross. Literally, we were once dead in our trespasses, enslaved to sin, working our way to nowhere and in desperate conditions. But upon the awakening of our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit and brought into faith, we can be born again brought back as a new son into God's family, an adopted son, Paul calls us. We were once dead and now alive. And look how the father declares the return of his own son. He says, this father, this son now, the son of mine was dead and has come to life again in verse 24. He was lost and has been found. This is the perfect picture of God's grace to men and the way by which he restores them to his family. But that's only the first half of this story. 
Like we've said before, this is a story of two sons, not one. So now Jesus turns his attention to the other son. And we've said already that about 40% of the verses in this parable actually relate to the other son. But we're going to read them all here in one grouping so that we can better understand this son's perspective. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of his servants, and he said... and he, And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. And he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you and and I have never neglected a command of yours. Yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you've always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, and was lost and has been found. Jesus begins with the story of the older son by mentioning that this son is in the field when the time for this party begins. And this is an interesting detail since we already know that this is a wealthy family. This is a family with plenty of hired servants. There's a large estate, apparently. When you look at some of the details of how this party is being conducted, it's evident that this family has money. And as the sole remaining son, this older boy would have had little reason to invest his time working in the field. Remember, the father at this point has only one heir, because before the younger son returned, there really was no one else in the family. So there's only one man in this family that is going to inherit all this wealth, and he's going to begin operating as if he is the owner under the careful watch of his father so he can be brought up in the family business. And the last thing you're going to want to do if you're in this position of authority and responsibility is go out like a hired man and work in the field, which it would have been a strange thing for the son to be in the field. And moreover, not just that he was in the field, but when you look at how things transpired, he's so far from the house that the events of the family uh, that have gone on in this family with this young son returning and this desire now to throw this big party, these are events that would have taken some time. Just, Just to get ready for this party would have taken days. And so for the servant to have to tell the older son what has happened indicates that the older son has been out for quite some time. And this is really unusual. And what it seems to suggest to me is that there is not a very close relationship here between this older son and his father. They're not working side by side. The father and the son are not partners in any respect, any real respect. It seems evident that this older son is off on his own at a distance from his father, but yet still living within his father's home. And when he comes back and he finds out about this party, he learns that his father has shown grace and mercy and and loving kindness to his wayward son, the older son becomes angry. Now, in in some ways, I guess this is understandable. You and I, as we hear this story, there there might be a part of us as well that that almost feels as though the father here is being unfair, that that he's uh, too easily receiving his son back. As a parent, don't you want to teach your son a lesson here? Wouldn't, Wouldn't you have some sense of, some feeling of maybe not giving him, uh, giving it all back to him quite so easily. Uh, of re- you know, sometimes you could actually say things like, "Well, he's rewarding his son for his son's poor behavior." Can you can you hear those words in you in yourself a little bit? Uh, at first, we're somewhat sympathetic, I guess, to this older son as he is angry with his father. But until you consider that God the Father has shown us the same grace that we're seeing the father here show this younger son, then then maybe if the roles were reversed, you would come to a different understanding. That if he's done it for you, why shouldn't he do it for someone else? That, That would be the correct perspective to bring to this moment. But this older son, the older son couldn't understand the concept because the older son didn't need grace. You see how grace changes your perspective when you've received the grace that you did not deserve. Well, then you're t- you see grace in a totally new way. You, you come to the understanding that grace is something to be rejoiced over. That the fact that the Father received you and now he's re- ready to receive the next person who would believe the gospel, well, so much the better. But until you re- recognize the need for grace, until you understand how important grace is, and as long as you live a life thinking you don't need grace, well, then it makes no sense. This older man, this, this older son, 
could not understand his father's grace and could not praise his father for what he did because this father should be rewarding the one who earns his grace and his favor. He should be rewarding the one who has done the work, not the one who has squandered his life. And this older son is so upset that, as we hear in the text, he refuses to even join the celebration. He won't go into his father's house. He stays outside pouting over the situation. And what's even more shameful is he demands that the father come to him. And did you notice the father went? This, this by the way, is another one of those extremes I keep mentioning in the story. Here we have the extreme of, of a father actually willing to leave the house and come out to a son that's pouting in the field and won't come in. This would never have happened in Jesus' day. No father would have, would have done this. No self-respecting man would have lowered himself in this way. It's a shameful act on the part of the father to go out, the, out of the home and, and to um, give in to a pouting son in this way. And when he finally comes to hear the complaint of this son, the older son says, I have served you for years. But I want you to also notice the way he began that statement. He, he begins with the word, look. This was a very shameful way to start a, to, to, to address the father. You know, you and I hear that phrase a lot today. It's actually a fairly contemporary thing to say. Look, I was just going to say this or that. Look, it's the way we can start a sentence. And it's uh, very common, very accepted. But in Jesus' day, it was outlandish. The son would have been expected to show extreme respect for his father at all times. If you go back in the Old Testament, particularly if you go to Genesis and you look at how the patriarchs and how their story is told, and you'll often see the, the son of a patriarch uh, addressing the father, and it's always in the most deferential and respectful terms. Yes, father, I am here, father. What do you wish, father? It's, uh, it's always with that tone. And here you see an older son say to his father, who has graciously come out to hear his complaint, you hear the older son begin with, look, it's, it's unheard of. It's, again, another extreme on top of all the previous extremes. And he says, I have served you for years. I have paid careful attention to all your commands, yet I never received any celebration for my effort. You, you never prepared for me even a goat, much less a calf. But now you're willing to celebrate with this son of yours, you notice that comment, the son of yours, who used your wealth and used it to buy prostitutes. Did you also notice what the son wanted? The older son says to the father that he wanted a celebration, but not just any celebration, not the kind that his father was hosting here, for example, for the younger son. No, he wanted a celebration that he would have had with his friends. It's a big difference when you consider what the celebration is all about. You know, we talk about the celebration as if the son was really the son, the prodigal son was really the focus. And, and certainly he was a part of that celebration for obvious reasons. But in reality, that celebration would really have centered around the father. The father and the father's willingness to re receive that son and to show him grace and to, and, and to show mercy, that would have been celebrated. The father's restoration of a son itself would have, been, would have been celebrated. The very fact that this father now had a son, that where before he, he didn't have this son, the son was gone, he was considered dead. Remember, the father says, he was once dead, he's now alive, alive to me. Let's go celebrate. So the celebration was really all about the father, about the father's gain and the father's mercy to the son. But this older son in the field, he wanted a celebration too, but he wanted a very diff different celebration. He wanted a celebration about him and his friends, not one that would revolve around the father. He has no love for this father. He has no shared joy with this father. The father should be doing things for this older son because the older son has earned them, because he deserves them. These are privileges he's earned. And he says, look, you're not being fair. You're not giving me what I deserve. And he's angry because someone less deserving was receiving his father's love. And then look what the father says. The father turns to the older son and he says, and I'm going to paraphrase here because I, I, I want you to get a sense of what's really being said in these words. The father looks at the older son and says, why are you complaining? Why do you feel shortchanged here? You, you always had access to everything that I had. You, you could have always received all that I have to give you. You just had to come to me in love. You just had to come the way your younger son has come. You know, you can't earn that love. You can't earn what I'm giving. All the work that you're doing has not earned you what you desire because you can't earn it. 
And when the lost have come to their senses, and when my son who was once dead has come alive, that is worth celebration. Because we celebrate the fact of the transition, of the return. We don't celebrate the effort, the work. Because for you and I today, it's no different. Do you know the celebrations that will take place in heaven upon our arrival and upon Christ's receiving of his bride? That celebration is not about what you and I have done. It's not a celebration that you and I were smart enough to understand the gospel or we were rational enough to appreciate it or that we were sensible enough to receive it. It'll be a celebration over what God did in our hearts, in his grace and in his mercy, while we were yet still enemies, while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. That while we were still not interested in him, he was though interested in us and willing to do the hard work on our behalf. And then gracious to bring us the knowledge of the truth while we were still opposed to him and enemies of him. So when the celebration takes place, yes, it will be a celebration of of lost sons restored, but it will be ultimately a celebration that honors the Father and his work, not our own, because our work is but filthy rags to Christ and to God the Father. And this parable, as we see it end here with the older son, gives us the perfect capstone, the the concluding application for what we see in our own lives today. You know, when you look at both of these sons, the older and the younger, they're both sinners. They were both in rebellion to the Father. It was just that one was overt and obvious and unabashed in his rebellion. But the other, the older son, he was a hypocrite. He was the one who was determined to earn favor and to receive what he felt he had earned. And he was willing to be there with the Father and to work in the Father's home and to associate with the Father. But it was not out of a love and out of of humility and out of a recognition of the Father's grace and mercy and kindness. No, it was a business arrangement. He was doing his part and the Father was obligated to do his part. He was a hypocrite. You know, the younger son, he, he was brought low and he was brought to his senses because of the grace of the Father. But the other son, he remained indifferent and he remained unrepentant and independent of the father right down to the end. That younger son, he returned to the father with a new heart and a new desire to serve and to be a loyal son, a son who would never leave again. But this other son, this older son, he remained steadfastly proud, separated from the father even to the end, demanding that the father would come to him on his terms And not that he would be willing to humble himself and go before the Father on the Father's terms. And therefore, one of these sons has been restored to sonship, though he was deserving of judgment. But the other son, he remains outside the family, outside the family celebration, on the outside looking in, the whole while expecting to be rewarded for a diligent service. You know, as we end tonight, as we finish chapter 15, I want you to know that Jesus has taught this parable for a reason. And he's taught it principally to illustrate to a, to a specific audience how God works in the world of lost sinners. It's a parable that illustrates not only that God will celebrate the lost being found and, and why he wants to celebrate the lost being found, but it also explains why the Pharisees are not receiving that message. And if you remember how this chapter began with Jesus sitting with sinners and sitting with the tax collectors and the Pharisees grumbling over watching that happen, In that moment, Jesus tells these three parables, finishing with this one today on the prodigal son, because he's responding to the Pharisees grumbling. They are the audience here. And he's showing them why Jesus has turned his attention to the sinners who are receiving him and who are hearing him and listening with joy to his message. And he's also explaining to the Pharisees why they themselves don't get it, why they don't understand it, why they're on the outside looking in, why they will one day receive the wages that they have earned. For the wages of sin are death. And finally, it's also valuable for us as we end tonight to think about why Luke includes this chapter. Remember I said last week that Luke alone records most of what we see here in chapter 15. Luke alone records the prodigal son parable. And it's such a remarkable thing to consider that a parable this Notable, this remarkable would only show up in one of the gospel writers' accounts. But in Luke, it makes sense. 
It makes sense that Luke would put this here because we've just gone through several chapters where Luke has shown how Jesus appealed to the nation, how he was rejected, how he confirmed that rejection, and how now he has yet some ministry remaining with his disciples before he reaches the cross. But who is he going to minister to outside of the disciples? If he's turned his back on the nation because the nation first rejected him, then who is left to hear his message? Who is the audience for the gospel? And Luke in chapter 15 demonstrates that God is about changing hearts of the lowly and the humbled and the destitute, those who return to him because they know his kindness. And it is those who are still receiving him, even up to the point of the cross, while the established elite, the men who expect reward because of their work, are being turned away, are being ignored by God, and rightly so. And as we move out from chapter 15, I want you to notice, you'll see this as you look through the gospel, as you kind of scan over the chapters that follow, we're still going to see parables. We're still going to see teaching to the crowd on occasion. We're still going to see a lot of teaching to the disciples. In fact, for the most part, over the next series of chapters, the teaching really begins to focus more and more and more on the disciples. But you won't see a lot of confrontation with the Pharisees, a few here and there. But the focus of the gospel now begins to move away from the Pharisees because we've put that issue to rest here. We understand their motivation. We understand why they rejected Jesus. We understand why Jesus turned his back on them. And that issue now having been settled, it's time to move on to other issues. And so for the next series of weeks, we're going to be in the chapters that deal principally with Jesus' teaching to the disciples. Remember, he's about to leave. He needs them to pick up the mantle of the, of the faith and to take the gospel to the four corners of the world and he has to prepare them for this difficult mission and he needs them to have the right perspective. And so much of the teaching that comes now for the next series of chapters is directed at building the disciples up for the mission that they have a lay, laid ahead of them. But remember, if this is a teaching that can be applicable to the disciples then, then these are teachings that can be applicable to you and I today. But I want you to be ready because there are going to be some convicting weeks coming up. As much of this teaching is probably going to hit us squarely between the eyes and challenge us to look closely at how we're living our lives. But that's what Scripture should do. Thank you, and and let's end our night in prayer. Father, the parable of the prodigal son is something that we all remember. And we all remember so well because it is so close to home, Father. It is a story that reminds us of the love of the Father and reminds us of the graciousness that He bestows upon His children. And it reminds us, Father, of our need to repent of our sin and uh, the essential need to come and of the essential need to come back to the Father on our knees, repenting of our sin and willing to accept His grace. But Father, if it is a story that is only known for those things and is only interesting for those reasons, but it never, Father, challenges us to go out and to help bring this message to those who are lost, then it has done no good for us individually, Father, because we are called to do action with what we've learned. And I praise you that you have brought us here tonight. I praise you for the teaching tonight. And I I ask, Father, that you would stir us to uh, change lives, to, to go out with this message and to be your ambassadors as you ask us to. And, Father, if it be your will, we pray for an opportunity to continue in this study in the weeks to come, Father, to move steadily through this gospel. Please bring us back here next week and send us home safely tonight. I praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.